Okay. All right, ready to go. Uh, all right, thanks everybody uh, for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Adam Capitanio. I am the Director of Programs at Humanities New York. Um, and with me this evening are my colleague, Joe Murphy and uh, Professor Jennifer Anderson. Um, as the Humanities Council of the State of New York, Humanities New York seeks to strengthen civil society and the bonds of community using the humanities to foster engaged inquiry and dialogue around social and cultural concerns. Um, and tonight's program is the fourth in our uh, land liberty and loss uh, suite of programs. Uh, and it's the first actually that deals specifically with um, indigenous people uh, on what is now called Long Island. Um, land liberty and loss is an exploration of our nation's founding and how its history or more pointedly maybe misapprehensions of that history uh, often serve as an obstacle to democratic and civil, civic flourishing. Uh, and the project is grounded in the historical and ongoing intersections between racial justice, uh, including the centuries long deprivations endured by uh, indigenous people and Native Americans uh, and the evolution of the American landscape. Uh, land liberty and loss is meant to prompt reflection on assumptions about the human connectedness between natural and built environments and allow us to reconsider in a holistic sense uh, how the revolution, American revolution, which resulted in the United States connects to or disrupts indigenous histories, our use of uh, natural resources, political development and national expansion. Um, and previous land liberty and loss programs featured Alan Taylor, uh, Melisande Schrems and Alyssa Mount Pleasant. And uh, if you're interested in those programs, if you haven't seen them, they're all uh, on Humanities New York's uh, YouTube page. Tonight's event, as I already mentioned, is going to feature my colleague, uh, Joe Murphy, who's the Director of Grant Making at Humanities New York, in conversation with Jennifer Anderson. Uh, Jennifer Anderson is Associate Professor of History at Stony Brook University. Uh, she has an MA from the Winterthur Program in Early American Culture and a PhD in Atlantic History from New York University. She's the author of Mahogany, The Costs of Luxury in Early America, uh, which was published by Harvard University Press in 2012. She's received many fellowships and awards, including most recently uh, Mellon and ACLS fellowships. Um, as a member of the research team, she also shared an Emmy nomination for the documentary Traces of the Trade, a story from the Deep North. More recently, she curated an exhibition at NYU about Sylvester Manor, a 17th century slave plantation, completed a major research report for the National Park Service about the William Floyd estate, and served as an advisor uh, for Long Island Museum's groundbreaking exhibition, Long Road to Freedom, Surviving Slavery on Long Island. While a scholar in residence at the Joseph Lloyd Manor uh, with Preservation Long Island, she also helped develop a new orientation exhibition about its most infam famous inhabitant, Jupiter Hammond, the first published African-American poet. Uh, deeply committed to public history, she continues to collaborate with museums and historical organizations throughout uh, the greater New York region. Um, and we are looking forward to the conversation tonight. And with that, I will turn it over to Joe and to Jennifer. Thanks so much, Adam. Uh, and welcome, Professor Jennifer Anderson. It's such a pleasure to be in conversation with you this evening. Thank you for joining me. Um, part of my um, vision for Land, Liberty and Loss, our program at Humanities New York, um, has long been to situate the American Revolution and its legacy into this much longer history of indigenous peoples in North America. And um, in this case, the, the, within the political construct of New York State. And so zooming into Long Island, in particular, your specialty. Um, let's start with the, the first question. Uh, how would you describe Native people's relationship to the natural environment on Long Island? What traditions, ideas, and social practices connected them with their ancestral lands and waters, given that we are talking about an island? Well, you know, this was a, a topic that really I became interested in when I first arrived at Stony Brook University and, and uh, began to appreciate the incredible uh, beauty and uh, uh, 
of the coastal regions around Long Island and beginning to learn about the, the native history and uh, and you know teaching about the region. And one of the things that really uh, quickly becomes apparent is the way in which native people on Long Island uh, you know were deeply um, you know, had a deep and abiding spiritual and material connection to the lands and the waters of their ancestral island. And uh, you know, there it's a very diverse region in you know in the pre-colonial period already. There are uh, you know, at least thirteen Indian nations, which each had their own identity and they were interconnected. But the thing they really share is their uh, connection with the natural environment. And uh, you know, Long Island, uh, blessed with abundant natural resources and a relatively moderate climate, uh, hospitable terrain, it really had a great appeal for human habitation. And as an island, uh, of course, so it's its most salient feature really were the, the water on all sides, Long Island Sound, the Great South Bay, and of course the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, these bodies of water along with their coastal zones really become uh, the most you know, defining aspect of, of daily life and the modes of uh, subsistence for Long Island's native peoples, as well as for their cultural practices, uh, spiritual beliefs, and uh, relationships with other living beings. Uh, so it's really, I think, in order to understand Long Island, you absolutely have to understand the importance of its native uh, peoples and, you know, their connection to that natural environment. Yeah. And so turning then to the sort of uh, post-contact period um, and, and the centuries and then, you know, more uh, focused the, the, the decades leading up to the American Revolution, what major impacts did the development of the English political economy and settler colonialism in the 1650s through the 1690s have on Long Island Indians in particular? Well, I should you know, just to, to preface that, you know, before the advent of, of colonization, you really see Native peoples, uh, you know, using all of the, uh, you know, plants and animals and other resources of uh, Long Island as part of their subsistence, hunting and gathering and utilizing uh, uh, wild plants and other kinds of resources. And, and, uh, you know, really uh, also engaging in agriculture and having a, what we would consider today a, a really sustainable mode of living. And again, relying on uh, resources of the maritime realm, such as shellfish and fishing and whaling. And uh, as, you know, with the advent of the English, first the Dutch and then the English as colonizers, they really begin to commodify land as well as those different natural resources in ways that really are incredibly disruptive, both to those earlier sub subsistence ways of living and uh, and other traditional practices. And, uh, you know, what happens really is that you see Native peoples beginning to be forced into the colonial regime and uh, having to, for example, shift from uh, purely subsistence modes of living uh, very autonomously, entering into the English economy and labor system and legal system in ways that uh, were, again, quite disruptive of their traditional ways of life. Oh, maybe we could get into that. Uh, to, to what extent did becoming enmeshed within this larger Atlantic economy change traditional ways of life over time for uh, Indians on, on Long Island? Well, you see it in a lot of different fronts uh, in terms of, uh, uh, for example, Native peoples beginning to rely more and more on uh, goods that they would purchase from English merchants and traders and oftentimes, uh, you know, becoming, you know, relying on those in ways that would put them into patterns of debt and having to, uh, having to then find ways to generate income in order to pay off debts, either with their labor or more and more 
with the sale of bits and pieces of their ancestral lands. And so that becomes a really challenging economic pattern, but it's also reinforced in often negative ways by uh, things like uh, disease and warfare and conflict with other native groups that is uh, intensified by the, the presence of these European newcomers. Where did the Ukachogs, both before contact and after contact, reside in present day Long Island? Well, I got very interested in, uh, you know, in all of the native peoples on the eastern end of Long Island, and in particular the the Unkachab, When I was asked by the National Park Service to to do some research uh, about uh, the the William Floyd Estate, which actually is located on the ancestral homelands of the Unkachab people, which are in the town of Brookhaven and what is now Mastic, and. Uh, there is still today uh, the reservation there uh, adjacent to the William Floyd Estate um, in the near the Puspatuck Creek, uh, which still you know is a sovereign uh, entity recognized by the state of New York. So they're still very much present today. I'm glad you raised the topic of the Floyd Estate. So using the William Floyd Estate as a kind of microcosm of the changes we've discussed. How are the Unkachogs in particular impacted by their proximity to the estate? Well, in a lot of different ways, it, it again comes back to, to the issue of land, uh, because as Europeans, you know, English settlers begin to uh, increase their presence, we see them pressing in more and more on uh, the, you know, the different communities of native people. And in the area where the Unkachog were, you see several uh, major land <laughs> buyers, including William Tangier Smith in particular, who was a well-connected settler. And he begins to buy up bits and pieces of their land and then um, you know, selling it to others. And he begins to accumulate a large uh, mass of land. And you know, as uh, you see native people entering into business and other kinds of uh, uh, economic relationships with these settlers, uh, they end up having oftentimes to sell pieces of land in order to pay off debts and uh, avoid other kinds of uh, uh, punitive situations for, for their uh, tribal members. How would you describe, oh, and before I move on, actually, uh, I just wanna say if folks have any questions, uh, in the spirit of Humanities New York's community mm -hmm. conversations, uh, don't hesitate to uh, enter questions into the chat, if anything, um, as will certainly be the case, if anything picks your interest, um, enter it into the Q&A function, and I'll be taking a look, and we'll make sure that um, questions uh, get their moment. So just a public service announcement about that. Um, but um, the question I was going to ask, Jennifer, was, how would you describe the mixed labor system on Long Island during the colonial period uh, generally? And then more specifically, did the Ungachogs interact with Africans and African-Americans held in bondage on the Floyd estate where we know um, enslavement was a major part of the uh, of, uh, uh, social and um, sort of political life on that historic site? Yeah. Well, you know, this is one of the really fascinating things about Long Island, and and uh, and uh, you know, you see this in other parts of the uh, American colonies, but in Long Island, in a very uh, almost kind of intimate way, because of the the juxtaposition that people are living in relatively close quarters, and the Floyd estate, as you know, the Floyd family uh, begin to acquire more and more land, they find that they're not able to acquire enough labor just using indentured servants. And so they actually begin to employ uh, people from the Unkachag uh, community adjacent to the, the growing estate. And they also begin to import enslaved Africans, which was already you know, beginning to be a significant 
part of the labor system on Long Island. So you have coexisting at the same time on one estate, you know, people who were uh, enslaved Africans from, uh, you know, West Africa and the Caribbean. You have uh, native people, some of whom were working for wages or under seasonal contracts or other kinds of indentures, men, women, and children. Um, and the other thing that we see kind of as a as an outcome of the of the issues with debt, for example, is individuals who get put into in, involuntary servitude. So, for example, if someone uh, wasn't able to pay their debt, they would be assigned to work for a term of labor and until they were able to pay off whatever it was they owed. And so all of these folks would have been live, you know, often living in close quarters in the estate or on the nearby uh, Kuzbetek village and, and uh, working alongside each other, doing all kinds of labor, agricultural labor, and uh, the Floyds have a shipbuilding works. They, for a short time, they had an iron forge where the men would have been working. And the women and children then would have been doing other kinds of agricultural labor as well as domestic labor. And uh, so all of that put together, you see the Floyds right beginning to accumulate wealth over generations, which allows them in turn, you know, to consolidate their, their social status and acquire more land and acquire more labor. And uh, so that's why we see, you know, the Floyds actually become one of the prominent landholding uh, families in the region over several generations. Fascinating. Um, and Jennifer, since we've, uh, we don't have any questions yet in the Q&A function, uh, it gives me the opportunity to pose another question. Um, and I'll take that opportunity. Um, <laughs> um, I, I um, was a, kind of surprised in doing research for this, uh, this conversation, uh, the extent to which Long Island had multiple, you know, in, in the course of its history had multiple um, sort of, uh, it, its position changed in the world economy over time. And I guess that's true of any place, but particularly so with Long Island, given its proximity, both to what became New York State, but also New England, and the West Indies. And I, I was um, uh, sort of prompted to ask this question since you mentioned the relationship between uh, the estate and the Caribbean, uh, in particular with enslaved labor. Um, these are not, this is not a question that you and I discussed prior to uh, the session, but I'm wondering if you could just say a few words for our audience um, who, like me, may be less familiar with Long Island's connections to New England in particular historically, and to the West Indies in particular, I find that fascinating. Well, you know, this is actually the topic of my my uh, forthcoming book. <laughs> I'm, so, ah. I'm still working <laughs> on it, but this is something I've been researching because I've also been really interested. I actually started out as a as a scholar of the Caribbean and, and of slavery. And so the fact that I ended up getting an uh, academic position uh, on Long Island was kind of a fluke. I could have ended up, you know, anywhere given given the way academia is. So, uh, you know, I, I'm always one to to say you should grow where you're planted. And uh, so I have really delved into this history, and it's really fascinating because what we find is that initially Long Island is, you know, as a you know a maritime realm is really geared toward the Atlantic and toward uh, overseas commerce and. You know, today we often think of Long Island as sort of a you know suburb of New York that's mm -hmm. connected with the Long Island Expressway and the Long Island Railroad. And, but uh, before the 19th century, Long Island was really geared you know much more toward uh, New England across Long Island Sound. I mean, Eastern uh, Long Island. I mean, you know, it's closer by sea to New England. Uh, so a lot of their trade would have been going through larger seaports uh, like Boston. And their main export markets for their crops, you know, pr producing uh, wheat and uh, other grains, as well as uh, fish and, and uh, raising uh, uh, beef for cattle, all of these kinds of uh, agricultural farm products 
you know, one of their main markets was in the West Indies on the sugar plantations where, uh, you know, enslaved and native people on Long Island were producing the food that was sustaining uh, sugar workers, enslaved sugar workers in the plantations, uh, you know, half a world away. Mm. And uh, in some cases, there actually are uh, landowners who, who own estates both in the Caribbean and on Long Island. Uh, so Sylvester Manor, for example, would be an um, example of that where the owners, you know, started with a sugar plantation in Barbados and then acquired Shelter Island here uh, in order to basically serve as a provisioning plantation for their uh, their their sugar plantation. So I sort of think all of, of all of that is connected as as one one unit, especially because they're moving enslaved people back and forth between those places. And then over time, especially after the revolution, you begin to see this shift that New York begins, Long Island begins to shift back more, it gets more connected to, to Long Island. And that becomes, you know, the growing metropolis begins to become a, a more important market for their produce and, uh, and uh, really, you know, reorients uh, the, the way people are thinking about themselves in relationship to the, the state and the new nation. Fascinating. And I, I must assume that uh, some of our audience are familiar with these facts, but others like me less so. So thank you for that. Thank you for filling that in. Um, turning now to um, the uh, revolution itself, the, the revolutionary era, um, and later we can get to the legacies of the American Revolution. Um, I wanted to ask you, with the onset of the American Revolution, sort of moving forward now in time, how were Long Island indigenous peoples impacted by the conflict between uh, so-called patriots and loyalists? Well, you know, when the revolution breaks out, you know, Long Island is incredibly impacted because it ends up under British occupation uh, for the duration of the war. And it is a situation where pretty much everyone is impacted. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, some historians in the past have characterized the, the role of Native peoples as, as if they were sort of on the, the sidelines and this, this conflict was sort of swirling around them. Um, but more recent research, we're learning that there were indeed uh, Native people, for example, serving in colonial militias under arms. Uh, and uh, for example, the, on the Floyd estate, we know that uh, looking at uh, militia muster rolls, that there were individuals that would show up uh, Indian, you know, specified as Indians, but listed with their last name as Floyd, that they're affiliated with the Floyd estate. Um, so my assumption from that is that they were most likely Uncachag, although it's not specified. Uh, in addition to that, we, we definitely see uh, all kinds of uh, work that's being extracted from uh, the civilian population by the British. And I'm actually, you know, researching this at the moment because it's it's something that I think is a lot more complex than than we've realized that you have uh, the British basically employing native and enslaved workers in building forts and in hauling uh, goods and in provisioning, you know, hauling provisions for the the British military and you know, all of this on a landscape that was rife with violence and disruption, as you have patriots raiding, uh, you know, many patriots go into exile across Long Island Sound, but they come back and make raids. And the whole population is really divided politically between loyalists and, and patriots. And uh, so, for example, one of the loyalist uh, women who stayed on the on her land while her husband was off dealing with this conflict, she writes and describes, you know, the way that she is able to keep the farm going is thanks to the presence of some Ankachag uh, workers that are assisting her. So, you know, there was some work that's still going on, but that tends to be really overlooked in narratives of the of the revolution. What did patriot victory in the in the revolution mean for Long Island Indians, including these Ankachag workers that that you were just referring to those who, who returned to the Floyd estate. So in the aftermath of the conflict, what were sort of the consequences, generally speaking? 
Well, it's a time of a lot of uh, transition. And I think probably the, the most significant thing is that you see uh, the beginnings of anti-slavery movement and the uh, beginning of gradual manumission. And that has consequences for all uh, workers on Long Island um, because it you know, basically means that now you have a, basically a wage-based labor system. And so we see many of the same people coming back to work on the state after the, the revolution. Um, but you also see them getting involved with other kinds of activities in and around the area and developing their own churches and communities. We also see um, intermarriage between some of the enslaved and formerly enslaved people and the Unkachangs. And so really the emergence of a, of a very vibrant community. In the, I, I wanted to actually save the uh, discussion of uh, abolition and oh. anti-slavery uh, sentiments to the latter part, but since you raise it, I can't resist. Uh, so I'm gonna shake it up a little bit. Um, <laughs> as, as, as these revolutionary ideas about you know, liberty and natural rights, and I wanna put that in quotations, of course, strengthened uh, anti-slavery sentiment in New York. How did African-Americans, um, Indians, including Onkachug, and other people of color challenge the institution of slavery and, and and involuntary servitude, not just slave, chattel slavery, but um, what followed in involuntary servitude on Long Island. And how did they do this in the face of pretty fierce resistance from slaveholders and the state legislature? Yeah, well, you know, by, uh, you know, over the, the period that we're talking about, the late 17th and 18th century, you really see a system developing on Long Island and, you know, other places in colonial New York where uh, all people of color, with whatever their status, tend to be under uh, a very oppressive legal regime. And they tended to be, uh, you know, if they were uh, involved with some minor infraction, their uh, punishments tended to be more severe. And we still see people being uh, indentured in, ways that look an awful lot like slavery, even though uh, Native people were not so legally supposed to be enslaved. Uh, so after the revolution, you know, the, the, the ideas about natural rights and liberty really begin to uh, influence people to, you know, to think about, you know, to question uh, these systems which people had taken for granted. And we do see the beginnings on Long Island of people getting involved with the New York Manumission Society, which was, uh, you know, an interracial undertaking. It's often talked about just in terms of the white, uh, uh, you know, some elite people who, who get involved with that. But it was, uh, there were other people involved as well. And also within uh, the churches, uh, evangelical ideas, again, about uh, the equality of, of human spirits also is really important, especially even on the Puspatuck reservation, they had their own church and uh, the leaders of that church are important in, uh, in sharing those values as well. And, but it's a long process, you know, it begins, uh, you know, even before the revolution, you have people, you know, trying to question the morality, the economic uh, uh, you know, efficiency of uh, of the slave system, and it the law is finally passed in 1799, but it phases out slavery over almost two decades. And depending on when uh, a person's birthday is, you know, they mm -hmm. might end up uh, spending most of their life in servitude or they might serve an apprenticeship of, of uh, you know, until they turn 21 or, or 25, depending on their gender. Um, so there's this long period after re the revolution where it's very nebulous and uh, sort of a spectrum of unfreedom uh, before slavery actually comes to an end. And, uh, you know, a lot of people get uh, enmeshed in that system in, in ways that, uh, uh, you know, really prevent them from 
from being able to, to move to other jobs or to take other opportunities. And uh, most of Long Island, for example, has strict vagrancy laws and residency laws that are designed to keep people uh, close to the places where they were uh, initially working. And uh, that unfortunately, you know, really limited the opportunity that people had. This is a, a and we do have a, a couple of questions in the chat. I'll try to get to one of them. Um, but first, I, I wanted to ask you as a follow up to that, if we could sort of zero in on the Floyd estate again, um, when discussing the, the impact of gradual uh, abolition, how did the gradual demise of slavery impact the actual lives, the lived lives of individuals on the Floyd estate? And I'm, I'm particularly interested in um, light just went off here. <laughs> <laughs> My office light has a timer. Sorry. No worries. Uh, if you could say a few words about the the introduction of wage labor, and what that may have looked like, I don't know, uh, on the Floyd estate. So a kind of uh, snapshot, if you will, of lived experience uh, during this period. Yeah, in, in some ways, uh, it wasn't that different, you know, that we know, for example, you know, I spent a fair amount of time in the archives at the Floyd estate, which is all of the, you know, family papers that record the, the economic history of, of the state and uh, social relations, etc. And we could trace some of the individuals who you know, start out working at the estate and, uh, you know, as enslaved people or other indentures and then years later I still find them and they're still working there but now they're being paid wages um, and so in some ways it there wasn't a huge difference and even after uh, pretty much every other form of involuntary servitude has ended in New York um, we still find children, for example, indentured, Indian children indentured on the Floyd estate. And for example, their descriptions of, uh, you know, children, you know, going home to, to the, the nearby village to visit their families and then coming back to work at the estate. Um, and it's unclear, you know, oftentimes uh, children would be placed into indentures like that if their families were having challenges economically, or uh, you know, needed to you know uh, place their child in a in a place where they would uh, be able to be relieved of the economic stress of them, and it could be really challenging, especially for single mothers who had difficulty finding work, you know, to to move. And so a lot of the people basically end up staying at the estate uh, even mm -hmm. after uh, they're required to stay there. It's funny, you know, the, the, I see this um, process that you're describing as one of the, it, it probably the great paradox to emerge from the American Revolution, there, and there are many, um, this, this transfer of property rights from the person of the, um, of the laborer to the, to the labor, <laughs> to the actual labor of, of the person. And uh, that, that terrible calculus of property rights when, that you mentioned a moment ago, of, you know, it, de it depends when your birthday was, right? If, if you were born before the date, um, things look very different. And so it's, it's, a, it's a, um, a terribly affecting story, but at the same time, this is the first generation of, um, of um, either enslaved or quote unquote free um, African-Americans who have the prospect of abolition um, to ponder and what that might look like. And of course, many of these young people who are born in this uh, period, right, are uh, grow up to be some of the most famous um, activists and abolitionists of the uh, the latter part uh, of this story, the, the the antebellum era. We have a, a question um, from Caleb Lamont, and it reminds me, uh, Professor, that you and I had talked back in September, and we were laughing that, or at least I was, because. I was making all these generalizations, you know, these big uh, statements about, you know, capital H history. And for each of my generalizations, you had a, a, a sparkling anecdote, um, a really, really nice story about actual people who lived in actual places and their lived experience. I'm wondering if Caleb's question here um, can provide some insight um, along those lines. We'll see, maybe not. Uh, 
but um, Caleb is calling back to the, the woman that you had mentioned, um, I believe on, on the Floyd estate uh, during the revolution, who was, um, you know, whose, whose husband, I believe, had gone off to fight in the, in the revolution um, and whose Unkachag neighbors, um, laborers on the estate had helped run that uh, enterprise, if you will. Um, uh, Caleb is wondering um, who this person was and um, are there any individual names and if you could offer more detail about that particular um, passage in, in Long Island history. Yeah, yeah, her name was Ruth Smith and she was uh, on that, uh, uh, the Tangier Smith estate. And, uh, it, you know, it's really interesting that the way in which we see, you know, women and, you know, most of the Patriot women end up leaving Long Island and go into exile uh, and, and uh, William Floyd's wife does. And other uh, loyalist women often are staying uh, in the area but you know, increasingly, you know, facing really challenging situations, and in that instance, the the way we know about what was going on with her is that she writes letters, uh, you know, seeking the support of people in, in positions of, of of power within the the British uh, regime, and she and she writes about the mentions the fact that she's able to keep going because. Uh, uh, because these Indian workers are helping her and, and rather patronizingly says that sort of to the fact that they've been, they've been behaving themselves well. Uh, so it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, but, you know, you know, looking at uh, what's happening during the, the war, it's, it's fascinating because we, we have records of, uh, you know, uh, people working, uh, hauling things for the British, and then they show up in the, the records um, you know, to get their pay slips or enslaved people, uh, basically they don't get paid, but their owner gets paid. And in some instances, we know that uh, enslaved people took advantage of the disruption to self-liberate and, and make their way to, to, to the British uh, headquarters in New York City. And some of them, in fact, end up going when the, when the British leave after the, you know, having lost the war, they evacuate from New York City and they bring with them about 3,000 Black loyalists. And I was just looking, you know, the Book of Negroes is where they their names were recorded. And I was just looking at this with my student the other day. And there, you know, it's listed, you know, people who were coming from Long Island um, and one one free Indian from Long Island, which I was fascinated, uh, you know, that, that uh, they would be leaving and ending up in Nova Scotia with the uh, you know, white loyalists who, who leave and you know, their former slaves all ending up in the, the cold snowy uh, uh, environment of Canada. It must have been a, a hard landing. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we have uh, several questions here and I wanna get to them. Uh, and, um, and that's a reminder folks to uh, keep it coming. Uh, send in your questions on the Q&A and I'll, I'll make sure um, that we can get to as many as possible. So uh, Caleb Munn here reminds me that, you know, my remarks at the top of the of the hour about how um, I want to try uh, to the best of our ability here to situate this story of the American Revolution within this much broader, much longer history of in Indigenous North America. Um, and, and Campbell's question, I think, uh, reorients the conversation in that direction, so I appreciate it. Um, and, and perhaps, uh, Professor, you'll have something to say about this. Um, Campbell writes, I was hoping you could potentially speak on how Native American sort of land uh, usage, uh, the development of land, the, the presence on the land, the, uh, for instance, burn sites, cleared fields, planted fields, um, how all of that guided European settlement. So we talked earlier, right, about the impact of British political economy, English and then British political economy on um, Native peoples uh, on Long Island. Um, but it's a it's a dialogue, right? It's a it's a two way uh, street, as it were. So I'm wondering if you could um, speak to that at, at all uh, before we get to Joshua Ruff's question. Yeah, probably the most uh, uh, interesting example that of that that I can think of is. Uh, that there was the practice on Long Island 
of taking over planting fields, which had been used by native people and uh, often uh, mistakenly, Europeans would think that these fields were abandoned, even though native peoples would use them seasonally and rotate their use from, from one season to another. And, but they would come in and they would find the, the land you know, cleared and you know, planted, uh, although native people were not using the same kind of plow, uh, you know, straight furrow agriculture that Europeans were used to. But if these areas were cleared of trees, they would take them over. And at the moment, I'm actually helping to, to write a short history of a wonderful historic site and botanical garden that is called Planting Fields. And going back and actually being able to document, you know, back to the 17th century, uh, the history of those fields being uh, taken over by Europeans and basically usurping that land. Uh, for their own uses. And it's just fascinating that uh, it shows up in the colonial records as, you know, the Indians planting fields or old fields. And I am able to, you know, to, to trace that connection right up to the 20th century. Fascinating. And that was a real uh, epiphany for me, you know, to, to hear the, the words planting fields uh, in that context. And now we're talking Long Island. Okay, now I get it. So, uh, <laughs> Joshua Ruff um, is wondering uh, if you could maybe say a few words about the Quaker community on Long Island, um, if, if possible. Um, did they, to, to your knowledge, express any specific interest and especially empathy toward um, Native peoples uh, it, uh, on the island in the historical record beyond their involvement in abolitionist efforts for which they are most famous? Yeah, I don't, I'm not that familiar with their involvement with Native people. Um, certainly, they, you know, they have an uh, important role, as you said, in abolition and uh, the intersection of, uh, you know, their early pattern, you know, they were initially not against, you know, slaveholding. And I'm sure that they were probably also having indentured Indians as well in their workforce, uh, because that was the common practice, and the Quakers are the first right to move away from that and to begin to question these coercive uh, systems. But beyond that, I actually am not sure what uh, what other kinds of relationships they had. Well, now then is a good time to maybe turn back to the immediate aftermath of the conflict in the Revolutionary War. Um, and, and we have plenty of time to discuss this, so feel free to elaborate um, on the questions I have for you about this. Um, I, in, in the immediate wake of the war, uh, as you know, right, many parts of the new United States saw renewed efforts by American settlers and land speculators to acquire more Indian lands. And you also saw, in turn, Native resistance to being dispossessed from their ancestral homes. So during this period, focusing on the Uncachugs, how did the Uncachugs respond to renewed demands to sell more land to William Floyd in particular and other wealthy white landowners? Well, you know, it's, it's an interesting period because uh, we see William Floyd in particular uh, quite aggressively moved to try and uh, basically consolidate and expand his land holdings and uh, he very much wants to uh, annex uh, the remainder of the Uncachug's ancestral homelands, which had already been severely diminished. And, and uh, he presses them to sell the land and, and uh, they actually refuse and they hearken back to an earlier agreement back in the 1700s when Tangier Smith uh, had entered into an agreement with them, guaranteeing them ownership of their remaining lands if they would validate the purchases of lands that he had made previously. And so they, they have that legal uh, agreement and that becomes their defense when, when uh, William Floyd tries to usurp their land. And uh, 
you know, they refuse as, as a group when he approaches their, their uh, leadership. And what is particularly insidious uh, to my reading is that he then decides, you know, he doesn't give up, but instead he goes and presses some of his own employees, you know, the Uncachuk men who are working for him. <coughs> Uh, and uh, you know, relying on on his uh, his his uh, good graces for their livelihoods, and he tries to press them individually, even though uh, it was against state law at that point to have individual you know to to enter into land transactions on an individual basis like that. And uh, you know, fortunately, they had the wherewithal that they they also refused. And so the Unkachag were able to uh, fend off his his uh, his efforts to get their land. And he ends up actually shifting his focus uh, from there to upstate New York. Could you elaborate on that last point? That's that's an interesting uh, tidbit there uh, that I know a little bit about from, from reading yeah. your material. But. Yeah, I think we talked a little bit about this. And one of the things that that that, uh, that uh, it starts before the revolution and that William Floyd gets involved with is that there was an effort to initiate a new community out in Oneida territory uh, to found a new community uh, that would be essentially a, a place where displaced Indians from Southern New England could uh, be could relocate and establish farms and kind of take up an English style of living. And it was something that was being promoted by uh, some of the uh, English clergy there in Long Island, as well as some of the, the native clergy. And uh, there's an effort to try and encourage some of the Long Island Indians to to leave Long Island, and and this is you know and again another effort to sort of push them to to leave and and head farther west, and with the promise that this would be a destination, and offered you know guarantees and offered you know support to move there, and the project is stalled by the revolution and you know things just kind of come to a halt but after the war ends they begin to revive this project and we have a historical record that talks about a, a, a very very mysteriously it says a group of gentlemen uh, approached the montaguets and other indians trying to encourage them to to sign on for this brotherton project and some of the Montauckets actually go out there and you know to investigate and they come home and basically say you know you know I'm paraphrasing essentially well you know it's very nice out there but you know what would we do for for clams what would we do for mussels like there's there's no ocean there and uh you know it doesn't make sense for them to to leave their ancestral homeland as long as they're able to to sustain some uh traditions and, and have that connection uh and so they refuse and fortunately because the brotherton project actually ended up being short-lived and most of its inhabitants you know within a few years uh are, again are pushed farther west in the face of uh, encroaching settlement a, a fascinating episode there i mean uh illustrative um of the the different conceptions of land right uh that that um touching i think um you know note that you know what could we possibly do up there um uh, given that you know our our entire um basis of living and uh the, the life we know is in the, at the shore or on long island itself that's the land yeah, itself whereas Kind of speaks mm -hmm. to you know how 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 deeply that uh, you know the the bond to to the the land and the waters of of uh, of this place uh, you know was so important to their sense of identity. Yeah, I mean nothing against upstate New York. I mean I love it, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's not. Yeah, but it also um, it demonstrates the uh, the. Uh, clear distinction between that approach to land and this more proprietary um you know speculator uh idea of land as a, as a commodity to be chopped up bought and sold and 
you know, what difference does it make? It's land that can be used for productive purposes. For yeah, the market and, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting because one of the, the dilemmas really for Long Island during this period is that there begins to be a, an exodus of, you know, smaller white landholders who are getting, you know, there's, it, it feels like there's limited room to, to grow and expand. And so, you know, the appeal of going West to, to op newly opened Indian territories on the New York frontier and points west really becomes attractive. And you know, that I argue in, in my book that, that you know, one of the reasons that we see these efforts to try and you know, keep working people of color you know, tied to the land is in part because these wealthy landowners really want to hold on to their, their workforce. And, you know, you compare that to some of the Southern states during this same time period, um, uh, as slavery is, is ending uh, uh, elsewhere in the North and the South, if someone was manumitted and gained their freedom, they were required to leave. Uh, on, Long Island, on Long Island, they're trying to get them to stay. And uh, so for example, uh, in, in the 19th century, when Horace Greeley is you know, writing, just telling young men, go west, young man, I have an essay where he very specifically says, uh, you know, African Americans or Negroes, uh, the term he uses, you know, you should, you should stay here in the east. And uh, uh, so that, you know, suggests a little bit of the, the dynamic that's going on in terms of social relations and, and uh, the property regime. Fascinating. Uh, the the racial dimensions of manifest destiny in the 19th century, we, maybe for another land, liberty, and loss. But um, I, I think it it does speak volumes about the um, like you you say that uh, it is uh, the opposite of what we see in the southern states at this particular point in history. And so in the in the sort of aftermath of the revolution and into the early 19th century. But um, I just want to ask if you see any similarity. I think I do with the reconstruction era um, in the south after the civil war where um, tying folks to the land was the main means of uh, maintaining as some have said slavery by another name if not chattel slavery well you you do see that certainly because it was so difficult for people to acquire land and the other thing that's really fascinating on long island because of its maritime maritime context um, is that uh, many native men and uh, Black men as well, if they couldn't acquire land of their own and they didn't want to be a wage worker for someone else, the other option that they had was to go into the whaling industry. And uh, this is actually something I've been really interested in uh, since a few years ago, we did a big conference at Stony Brook about the history of whaling and uh, uh, the papers from that actually are published online in the Long Island History Journal so people can go and read them. Uh, but what's what's so interesting is that this becomes one of the options and uh, that they could sign on with a whaling crew. And, you know, this goes back to early native whaling traditions that they had uh, you know, experience working, uh, catching whales, and they uh, work on colonial whaling crews. And then in the 19th century, as the whaling, uh, pop, you know, whale populations begin to get depleted and uh, the area of local <clears throat> waters, uh, the whaling industry goes farther and farther uh, into deeper oceans, farther away, and really becomes the first global uh, uh, industry on on the high waters, so to speak, and we have uh, you know local Long Island boys going all around the world on these vessels, and for some of these, especially the more skilled whalers, this was a way that they could uh, you know earn enough money that they could come home and settle and sometimes buy a small piece of land, and uh, so that you know, is one of the ways that people could break out. Not everyone did. Some people, you know, ended up uh, almost, uh, and historian John Strong talks about them as sharecroppers of the sea because they would uh, sign on with a whaling vessel, but they would run up expenses and uh, after three years of sea, come back home uh, in debt <laughs> to their employer and then have to sign on for another, another term. 
So it didn't work out for everybody, but it was one avenue of, of possible uh, progress that you see uh, really uh, has, has an important uh, effect for some people. And wouldn't you know it, Professor, uh, the, the, one, the one question we have in the chat is precisely about this issue of whaling and oh. question, uh, which you've answered, I believe, uh, about this aspect of Long Island's history, regardless of which sort of um, group of folks we're looking at. Um, Long Island is, as, you, as you've made very clear thus far, a maritime um, part of the world. And so um, it, it's a callback in many ways to our discussion earlier of the Atlantic economy and the ways in which Long Island was oriented to parts of the world that we don't usually associate it with in our modern times. Um, so I wanted to uh, get us back, however, to, from the sea back to uh, the, the um, Haudenosaunee territory and uh, the, the you know, greater New York. I, I was wondering, did the aggressive land speculation that we were just talking about in upstate New York, <clears throat> including that by the New York State Indian Commission of which William Floyd was a member, and maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Um, did that take some of the pressure, as it were, off Long Island native peoples? And um, here, if you could maybe elaborate on uh, and, and add some more color to William Floyd's machinations on um, Puspatuck Reservation. Um, but I'm wondering if, if there was some kind of uh, relationship between what was going on on Long Island and what was happening upstate, whether there was uh, a release valve of sorts uh, or pressure on the on the Uncachugs. Well, you know, I I think that there is, and you don't often see these things connected in terms of uh, Western expansion and what's happening here on the on the local level. But I think that they are interconnected, uh, you know, both for the reasons I, I mentioned earlier that you have, you know, so many, for example, new immigrants coming in, they don't, you know, they're not attracted to come to an area like Long Island if they can't acquire land. And so they end up going other places. And uh, William Floyd himself, as it happens, uh, becomes uh, a pioneer because he failing in his effort to try and take over uh, the Puspatuck Reservation, he actually uh, remarries, so that might have been part of it, he, he, uh, uh, after his wife passed away during the revolution, he, he remarries and, and starts a second family, and he actually decides to move out to uh, some of the land that he had acquired. So he was involved with all kinds of land speculation, but he actually establishes a new estate for himself out there. Uh, sort of the same way that William Cooper does in Cooperstown. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he hands over the estate on Long Island to his son. And uh, you know, the, it, it continues to be a productive estate for, for a few years, but increasingly the family you know, becomes more involved in other kinds of business and uh, are less involved with agriculture. But William uh, Floyd founds this whole new estate up on the frontier, and he brings with him a, a cohort of uh, African people. So this is before slavery ends. He brings them with him. Uh, I don't think they had any choice in the matter. He moves them up to uh, this new area and, and Westernville in New York and basically puts them to work building a new estate for him. And Interestingly, in looking at the land records there, I've been able to find you know, that some of them later were able to, you know, that left his, uh, uh, his estate and were able to acquire land of their own up there. Uh, at least one made his way to Canada and then ultimately ended up back on Long Island. So he must have had some strong ties there mm -hmm. that, that he came all the way home. And also in the, you know, by you, by the time you get into the, you know, the 1830s and 40s, you do begin to see, uh, very importantly, I think, on Long Island, the development of very vibrant uh, Black communities and social organizations and churches that uh, that often were uh, interracial. So 
we have uh, increase of Native and uh, African American people intermarrying, and uh, their communities, some of which you know continue to exist to, to this day, really provide uh, a kind of a refuge from some of the harsher aspects of white supremacy on Long Island, which does persist, and uh, that uh, they're able to, for example, develop schools and uh, and other kinds of mutual aid organizations that, uh, as well as, you know, just social fun things. And a lot of things like um, uh, uh, strawberry frolics and uh, evangelical tent meetings. So there, it seems like it becomes a very lively uh, place, very grounded in these communities. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I wanted to follow up about that because, you know, oftentimes in conversations like these um, about the revolution in particular uh, and its in, its impact on communities of color, um, there's there's a, a rightly so an emphasis on all of the obstacles that arose, and I want to get to those, of course. But I also want to ask you um, when you get your light on there <laughs> that uh, there it is. Very good. Um, you know, uh, let's talk about like the opportunities that arose in the aftermath of the American Revolution. Um, what what new opportunities emerged in the aftermath of the American Revolution for free people of color, including the, the folks we've been focused on thus far, um, African Americans um, and and native peoples on Long Island. You've mentioned a few of these already. I wonder if if we could kind of linger on them and um, if you have anecdotes to pull out or share just uh, some detail about what, say, a church or uh, intermarriage in particular offered um, in, in, in the wake of the revolution. Well, you know, I think um, I think that uh, you see that these uh, communities really become uh, Kind of interconnected that that you see more uh, engagement among different communities and for example uh, uh, people on Long Island getting involved with anti-slavery organizations that are also uh, national and attending conferences and conventions uh, that are bringing people together uh, that I think is really important that there begins to be sort of a, a stronger sense of solidarity um the the um sorry i'm drawing a little bit of a blank in terms of uh other examples no worries uh i'm wondering um if we could now turn to uh some of the obstacles that folks met at, uh in the aftermath of the revolution and into the 19th century so um and i'll i'll take this moment actually to uh remind folks that we have a Q&A and you can enter questions uh, into the chat function. Uh, just a reminder about that. Um, but uh, Professor, from the 19th century on, right, uh, how did the continued marginalization of people of color and entrenched racism impact Native communities on Long Island? This is something that um, we've discussed here and there, but I thought maybe we could Mm -hmm. zero in on it and discuss it at length. Well, you know, it's it's uh, a, a well-documented fact that Long Island still today is, you know, remains one of the, the most segregated uh, parts of the country. And it really goes back, I think, to these earlier patterns of, uh, you know, of restrictive land use and, uh, you know, housing being relegated to sort of marginal areas and in many of Long Island's affluent communities, you know, you, you look, you know, all up and down the the uh, the uh, South Shore, for example, the you know historic communities, there would be a particular neighborhood where you had basically a concentration of black uh, workers and other people of color, and they would be working in and around. Uh, the service industries continuing to work in agriculture and other things like that 
Um, and uh, but slowly, right, beginning to be able to in, reinvest and and build connections and build communities. And uh, you know, sometimes that happens very informally. For example, um, there's one community where uh, one individual named Kami, he he basically builds a shack for himself and sort of on the edge of the land where his, his employer, former owner had uh, had been uh, where he'd been working. And other people come and begin to uh, build little houses adjacent to his. And, and over time, they develop their own community and in a very organic way. And then later in the 19th century, there's more of an effort to develop planned communities. And so I've been studying one of these uh, that was actually founded by a black lawyer uh, from New York City who gets very frustrated with uh, you know, the, the obstacles that people of color are encountering and decides that he wants to create uh, a refuge, a black community that will, uh, uh, you know, foster black businesses and and organizations, and so he actually tries to establish this community on Long Island, and uh, goes out and is you know trying to find a piece of land to do this. And as soon as people, you know, the white people in the area find out about it, they they, you know, come in and and. Uh, uh, you know, with a lot of sort of hysteria, you know, uh, that, oh, you know, this is going to be a horrible thing. It's going to bring in thousands of Blacks from the South and undermine our our, uh, our work, you know, take our jobs and all this sort of thing. And they basically put the kibosh on that project and uh, he's not able to, to achieve that dream. Uh, but we do see other communities developing that, as I said, continues still to, to this day. And oftentimes it was as a result of people coming together and pooling their resources uh, to buy some land, to build a church, and and uh, you know, slowly to to find ways to improve their condition, improve their situation. I'd like to follow up, uh, Professor, by um, exploring the, the gender dimensions of this story. Did did working women encounter any special challenges in their efforts to sustain themselves and their families, particularly with regards to like land ownership and property, the, the very things you were just talking about a moment ago. Yeah, well, this this was something that, that uh, you know, I can point to some interesting examples that come up on the Floyd estate in the 19th century that, that, uh, that women, you know, if, particularly if they had small children, it was really hard for them to to find employment if they if they had a child with them. And so, for example, there's letters in the the Floyd archives describing one young woman who had been to New York City trying to find work, and she was turned away everywhere because she had a child. And finally, she ends up coming back to the Floyd estate and uh, the lady of the house agrees to take her on as a domestic servant uh, on the proviso that her little girl will uh, be able to earn her keep by doing needlework for, for, uh, for the family. And, uh, you know, so I think that's a good example of the way in which, um, you know, women had to make compromises really in order to sustain themselves and and their families, if they if they weren't able to uh, you know remain within their own communities, so there's a lot of displacement, and I think that's one of the reasons why we see you know see these Indian indentures of children, you know, quite a bit later than you might than you might expect. The last ones at the Floyd Estate were you know in the in the late nineteenth century. Yeah, I was struck in in reading your materials uh, that you had sent over in September, I think it was. Um, did it, this interesting, another kind of paradox again, uh, contradiction, wherein uh, indentured servitude for white persons after the revolution fades away. It doesn't even fade away. It kind of it's it's um, it's sort of ripped up and thrown out in the trash bin rather quickly, uh, in in the trash bin of history, as they say. 
Whereas for people of color, particularly formerly enslaved, or as we were saying earlier, those born into, um, you know, after the date of gradual abolition statutes, uh, indentured servitude becomes the norm, it seems, or at least when it comes to labor uh, contracts, it, it does not fade away in New York State as quickly as it does for um, white citizens. Um, and that's another kind of, again, racial dimension of this story when we're talking about land and labor. Right. So I just wanted to, to add yeah, that. It, it, it's a it's a period where, you know, I would agree that, it, you know, there there's a paradox of you know, the, these ideas about, uh, uh, you know, liberty for some being built on the on the uh, uh, exploitation of others. And, you know, in the uh, 1820s on, you do see a real trend toward democratization among, among white men. For example, property requirements previously that had limited who could be part of the electorate, those begin to be taken away. And the you know, small number of black men who were propertied who had been able to vote that stripped away from them uh, during this time period and uh, you know, not restored until later in the 19th century. And uh, so, yeah, the outcomes of the revolution, I think we can say are, are mixed in so far as, you know, some people really are able to transform uh, their situations and others find themselves still enmeshed in, uh, in these uh, more exploitative systems. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, folks who live on Long Island will certainly know this. Uh, those like me, I'm actually from New Jersey. Sure. Um, so it's a little bit like Long Island, but not quite. Uh, it is 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 the fact that Long Island is uh, arguably one of those most fragmentary places in the United States in the, in terms of its uh, physical layout of the towns um, and districts and count uh, 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 townships within. Um, and and along the lines of what we've been discussing today, it's a, it's a it's a particularly fragmented landscape when it comes to class and race. Um, as a way of sort of um, pushing us towards the, the closing of our session uh, tonight, though we have a, a few questions in the chat, which is great. Um, before we get to them, um, I'm wondering if you could say a, a, a few words about how this history that we've been talking about tonight contributed to contemporary Long Island's um, longstanding spatial segregation. Well, you know, I, it, you know, it's something that you can really chart over over time. The way in which, um, you know, communities of culture of of color get sort of pushed to the margins. Uh, for example, I've been researching uh, an area a little more on the western end of Long Island in Hempstead Plains, where for a long time that uh, area was regarded as sort of a, a wasteland. Which is ironic because you know during the colonial period it was really valued because it was a natural grassland and it was used for grazing for, for by the Dutch and by the English, but then it it uh, begins to get sort of eroded and people disregard it as a as a wasteland and and you know that's a place where you see you know people who can't afford more valuable land are able to to get a foothold and acquire land there. And uh, then as real estate begins to become more valuable and, and uh, developers start to move in, it's exactly those areas that begin to get revived and you know, people who, you know, working people who had been able to get a foothold there again, get pushed out. Um, so it's, it's uh, sort of an early uh, version of urban renewal or suburban renewal, I guess. Mm. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, I have so much to say, but I, I don't want to take up too much time. And we, we do have some questions here uh, that, again, I think will will uh, allow us to uh, uh, wrap up nicely. So just a, a, turning back to um, the discussion of indentures, and in particular, Ungachug, um, or more generally, um, native indentures on Long Island in the 19th century, Caleb, uh, has asked you, can you can you actually, um, do you know the actual sort of date or 
general time period of the last inden Indian indentured at the Floyd estate. Um, was that in the 19th century or, or was it? I have it in my notes. <laughs> yeah, you weren't kidding when you came when you said you came prepared. <laughs> I do have it in my notes if I can find it. That's the problem. No uh, worries. Take your time. <laughs> and we have we have plenty of questions. So uh take your yes, time. The, the we'll date that I have, and again, this is this is based on on their, you know, the, the family <laughs> record. So it might or might not be exactly accurate. Um, but uh we have the uh you know, for example, um in the 1880s, you know, uh, Ben Edwards, a young Inca Chug boy, was indentured by his parents to the Floyd. Floyd's known as Little Ben. He worked for them during the day, but went home each night. His family ties were clearly strong, since the Floyd's complained that they quote never knew where to find him, because he was always popping off home. In other instance, Martha, a young girl of mixed Uncachag and African-American parentage was bound to the Floyds until age 18. As compensation, her parents received $50 and she was given a freedom suit of clothes when her contract ended. Um, and then it, uh, toward the end of uh, the proprietorship of John Gelson Floyd, who was one of the, the later owners, around 1881, he ended the occasional practice of indenturing Indian children. And thereafter, the estate rem uh, remain, relied uh, only on wage labor. And it's right around that time also, they, they begin to shift from employing uh, uh, local Unkachag and African-American women as servants to young Irish women who are arriving as immigrants. and. Uh, so that's an interesting transition that kind of reflects the changing demographics uh, as yeah. immigrants begin to move out from New York City. 1880s, that, that sounds about right, absolutely. Yeah. And those watching may have seen, when you mentioned 1880, I kind of was taken aback, but, uh, and I don't mean to be glib, but um, I did not expect that. And yet, um, in hindsight, maybe I should have, you know, the fact mm -hmm. that um, that's the point of indentures and you're, uh, one of the key threads in your um you know presentation tonight is that um uh, uh tying people to the land for labor exploitation was uh, absolutely another, essential another way to look at it also is that in a in a period before there was really a strong uh social safety net uh indentures were one of the options you know not perhaps the most desirable option but one of the options that uh parents had uh, to place their children in the place where they would be uh, able to uh, have room and board and hopefully learn some skill or at least you know gain experience uh, as workers. And you know we have you know there are many of these indentures and reading them, you know you can get little clues to to what is going on with the family, sort of reading back through them and and uh, you know, across time. Uh, so, for example, I was looking at an indenture recently with my students that uh, dated from the 1730s, I think, and it described a mother indenturing her child for a certain period of time. And then when we did the math, we realized based on when, how old the, the child would be when his indenture finished, that the mother was indenturing this child when he was only two months old with the anticipation that then when he got a little bit older that he would start his indenture. So the mom sort of knew that she'd placed the child in a place where uh, where he would be cared for, uh, you know, but at the same time, you know, living and working within a, a you know, household like that, children were certainly uh, vulnerable to, to various kinds of exploitation. Absolutely. And another reminder of the, the terrible uh, sort of predicaments and uh, negotiating and navigating that folks in these political economies and specific sites um, had to do. Um, turning back finally to um, the contemporary uh, pe period on Long Island, we have two questions that I'm going to try my best to, to merge together mm -hmm. um, as a kind of final note. Um, uh, the first is um, uh, uh, were the were the Unkachogs ever recognized? Uh, not were they, but when 
was the sovereignty of the Uncachag um, recognized by New York State and um, presumably by the federal government as well. And then um, not so much relatedly, but also contemporarily. Um, how, if at all, is either the Floyd estate or Stony Brook engaging with native communities on Long Island today? Um, and what are the goals of that engagement? Mm -hmm. uh, well, the, the Uncachag are recognized by the states. I don't know exactly the date when that initiated, but I mean, they have had, you know, un, unbroken occupancy uh, you know, back to the, the, the beginnings of, of the colonial era. Uh, but they have not gotten federal recognition, um, and uh, you know that that is certainly a a challenge. Uh, you know, there's several uh, you know, the the Chinnacock Reservation and the Unkachug Reservation uh, are certainly um, you know still vibrant communities, which you know I, you know often people are very surprised to even learn that uh, that they still uh, have a presence here on Long Island to, to, the, to this day, but you can go and look at their websites and learn about you know, what, what their communities are, are doing and uh, the challenges and that, that they're having. Um, the, uh, in terms of uh, what my institution is doing, Stony Brook actually has been involved with a language restoration project uh, uh, with uh, the Unkachag, and they've actually just uh, initiated a new program in, in Native Studies here on Long Island uh, at the university that will be in partnership. And uh, we have other faculty as well that have expertise in other Native uh, communities outside of Long Island. Uh, so our hope is that that will be uh, a place where, you know, we'll be able to continue to learn and to uh, document this history and share the stories in ways that will make it more accessible and hopefully you know, bring in more native voices to the project. Uh, over the years, I've done things like, I think I mentioned I did this big whaling conference where we uh, were able to partner with David Martin of the Shinnecock Cultural Center. I don't think he, I'm not sure if he's still there, but he was the director at the time. And uh, you know his family were whalers, uh, so mm -hmm. when he contributed a, a presentation and then wrote an article, you know he was speaking about his his family and his ancestry. And uh, you know for me that you know to to have that very direct connection was uh, really inspiring. And uh, I I would hope that we'll be able to continue to do more work along those lines. Uh, the National Park Service, which owns the William Floyd Estate, they initiated this historic research report uh, really with a with the goal of trying to expand the interpretation of that historic site because it had largely focused on the history of the, you know, the, the signer of the Declaration of Independence on William Floyd and had not really delved as much into the, the stories of the people who lived and worked there and, and who, you know, who absolutely helped make his political career possible. And uh, at the moment, I'm not sure what, uh, you know, the, the status of that project is because the house is gonna be undergoing some restoration, I believe. Uh, but there again, my hope is that, that uh, this will give a chance to, uh, you know, look at that in historic site within a much broader context and to understand the, you know, complex human histories that that uh, it illuminates. A worthy ambition indeed. Professor Jennifer Anderson, thank you so much for joining us this evening and sharing out. Thank you. It's been my pleasure and good night, everyone. I'm going to bring in my colleague, Adam Capitano. Uh, here is Adam to say a few closing remarks. Good night, all. Uh, thank you, Joe. Um, I want to thank uh, Joe and Jennifer for uh, this uh, enjoyable and enlightening conversation. Um, I hope that all of you uh, enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, if any of you would like to revisit the conversation or um, you know pass it along to friends who might be interested, uh, it'll be posted on Humanities New York's YouTube page uh, in the coming days. Um, 
If you're also interested in continuing uh, this conversation in your own community, I would encourage you to apply for um, one of our uh, reading and discussion programs um, on the land, liberty and loss theme. Um, we have a specific uh, theme that's available um, through our reading and discussion grant um, on this very topic, um, the topic of uh, the relationship uh, between um, the uh, settler, um, the European settlers, the indigenous people, and the transformations of the land during uh, the revolutionary period. Um, the application for that grant, the reading and discussion grant, is open until December 11th. Um, and of course, you can always come to Humanities New York for grant funding for public humanities projects uh, and for uh, public humanities programming uh, like you've seen tonight. So uh, thank you very much for being here.